Hello and welcome to this talk about software engineering for configurable software. In this talk, I'm going to present you what I've done in research in the past 15 years. So you might want to understand why we are doing the research we are doing and what we are doing. But uh, this is not necessarily uh, representative for the research that we're doing right now, but rather representative some highlights of the research from the past 15 years. So enjoy the talk. In the first part of the talk, I'm going to talk about software and product configuration. So we can configure software, we can configure products. What are the problems with this? Why? So why do our people looking like this when it comes to software and product configuration? And I'm talking not only about end users or engineers, but also many different people involved in software and product uh, creation uh, and also quality assurance. So what's the problem here? Um, in, uh, if you look into this area of configuration, then you will find out that configurators are everywhere. So you can configure your car with your favorite uh, color and favorite uh, wheels and so on, but also this has some influence on the software within the car. Uh, you might want to configure your computer and on the computer you might have different uh, hardware that you can uh, uh, select, but also different kind of software packages. Uh, when you go to eBay or Amazon, you can select something and then you rather have something like a selector, but they typically have different problems. So here you can select for your mobile phone, you can select um, uh, yeah, uh, a case. Uh, and for the case, you can select the color, but you will recognize that not all the colors are available for all the models. Uh, this is uh, better visualized in uh, Amazon. If you buy a t-shirt, then you can choose the color and afterwards you will see what are the uh, sizes available. Of course, this is not obvious to uh, most humans because why would you change your, your t-shirt size because of your favorite color, right? So who wants to uh, lose weight uh, just because of a t-shirt? But uh, on the other hand, there's also uh, configurators for privacy settings and web services, for instance, here uh, with the example of Facebook, but there are also settings in um, uh, different uh, systems, like this is uh, a screenshot of Android uh, with some settings. Uh, in Windows, you have some settings, and here already uh, becomes uh, visible a problem, a potential problem. And the problem is that sometimes not all the options are available and the worst uh, a software system can tell you is they are not available, but not why. And probably the most prominent example of uh, uh, configurable software is the Linux kernel with a lot of development going on and uh, about uh, 20,000 configuration options. It's highly configurable so that we can uh, create uh, a lot more configurations out of the Linux kernel than we have atoms in the universe. And actually, uh, while it is known what is uh, the number of atoms in the universe, kind of roundabout, uh, it is not even known for the Linux kernel, right? So this is so complex that we cannot even count it. So why is configuration so hard, right? Isn't it just choosing your favorite features? So we can see this uh, when configuring a car uh, I've done this before and uh, I selected enhanced Bluetooth telephone with USB and voice control and what happened then is I need to select a few other features and very unfortunate that I cannot select anymore Microsoft Office for my car. So the problem with configuration, the main problem is that configuration options are typically not independent. There are dependencies and the question is how to model those dependencies. And that's what we have worked on in the past. Uh, that's the tool Feature ID. Feature ID is a tool for modeling those dependencies for configurable software, for configurable products. And uh, the main, or uh, we received support requests from uh, about 100 cities uh, from 30 countries. So it's used worldwide, mainly in research, but also in industry. And we wrote a book. Uh, this uh, explaining uh, what's the, what the tool is about and how you can use it and what problems it does solve and how they can be solved. So to look a bit more into detail, what the tool does is, uh, I have a small example here. The example is uh, a small server. The server has a file system. It has an operating system and it might have logging or not. So what happens now is um, 
when you do configuration, basically you do a selection what you need and everything that you haven't selected is basically what you not need, right? So that's a very basic assumption of configuration. You just make your choice, your favorite choice. But then, then comes the problem with dependencies because it could be that some of the options that you're choosing are actually not uh, uh, compatible to each other. So in this example, uh, you may not want, uh, you probably cannot choose uh, install Windows on HFS. So the problem is this is of course, you don't want to configure and configure like for hours, yeah? this large system with 20,000 configuration options, and then afterwards find out, okay, this is invalid. You rather want to have some support during the configuration already. You want to find out if I do that selection, I want to uh, understand which other options are still available or not available anymore. For this, you need a, a description of the available configuration space about the dependencies and a common uh, model for this is a feature model. A feature model describes the features in a hierarchy and their dependencies. So it doesn't matter uh, so much how this, uh, these feature models uh, look like and uh, what's their meaning. Basically, you can understand them as a propositional formula. It's just a propositional formula explaining you what are the valid combinations. So, and that's what Feature ID is about uh, and what the book is about, about how to use feature modeling for software and product configuration and for their analysis. So to explain you one approach that we've developed, um, uh, I would like to guide you to this small example. So the idea is to propagate the knowledge that we have about the configuration. So when the user selects the feature Windows, we want to find out which other features are still available. And what we do for this is we translate the feature model into a propositional formula. So the formula uh, is given here. So we have just uh, a propositional formula, the variables uh, are representing the features, and if a variable is true, then it means the feature is selected. If it's false, then it means it's not selected. And the feature model evaluates the true, the formula evaluates the true, if the combination of features is valid. And over here, we have uh, a conjunction with two other literals over here. Uh, first, uh, Windows, because the user has selected it, and we have the feature HFS because in this query we are interested uh, to find out whether Windows and HFS can be combined in a configuration. And what we can use, the, use for this query is a SAT solver. SAT solvers are uh, automated black box tools that you can use to evaluate these propositional formulas. So in this example, we will find out that uh, this is not satisfiable and what we can deduce from this is that HFS cannot be selected anymore. So we repeat this process for all the different uh, choices here and we find out that we can also not have macOS and Debian in this case. But there's also the other way around. So we can also check if it's still feasible to not select the feature, right? So we have the same formulas like before, but this time uh, for this example with uh, NTFS, we have the negated variable. And if we give this to the set cell, it will tell us whether it's still feasible to not select it. And if that's not the case, if we get a no, an unsatisfiable result, then we know that this feature uh, must be selected. So the, why are we using SAT solvers for this? Uh, the reason is that SAT solvers are very powerful tools and especially in the last like uh, 30 uh, years, there was a lot of progress and on the, the size of the, uh, the formulas that can be handled and also if you consider a certain size of a formula, the tools are getting faster and faster over time. So this is good news because we can answer these set queries in a very short amount of time. So what's the actual problem here that we have worked on? The problem is someone came to us and said, well, we used your tool uh, in an industrial setting and we've had a feature model with 18,000 features and we found out whenever we click somewhere, it takes 16 seconds uh, or 15 to 20 seconds uh, to compute the result. And this is infeasible, right? The user cannot wait for 15 or 16 seconds. So why was it taking so long? The reason is we have to answer, after the first click of the user, we have to answer uh, about 40,000 set queries. And even if every set query only takes a couple amount of milliseconds, then this sums up to a couple of seconds overall. So we introduced a new data structure for this purpose. Um, 
the data structure is an extended version of an application graph. An application graph is already known. You have literals, uh, literals meaning a variable or a negated variable, and you have strong edges between those. And a strong edge means that you have a direct implication from one literal to another. But these, uh, the problem with implication graphs is uh, they are known to, uh, yeah, you can easily answer queries uh, because it's actually a two-side problem and it's easy to solve. But the problem is you cannot express everything. You can express everything as a three-set but not as a two-set problem. So what we did in research, we extended this notion of edges to weak edges. And this brings us to the modal implication graphs where the idea is you have two modalities. You have strong and weak edges, strong edges indicating you have this implica implication no matter what the situation is, no matter in which process of the configuration you are. And we have these weak edges where we have to actually ask a cell solver to tell us uh, whether there is this implication or not. And how we can use this for propagation is, imagine the user selects the feature windows. Uh, what we can find out is we have a couple of strongly connected nodes, right? So these are nodes that we can go to by traversing the graph, only visiting strong edges. Then we have connected nodes. So these are all the nodes that are reachable either by, uh, by paths going through uh, th these directed edges, but it can be uh, strong or weak edges and both is feasible. And then we have all the nodes that are feasible, but uh, not necessarily all connected to this variable that we've just chosen. So the interesting part for for those uh, variables that are not connected, there's no competition, right? So for all these variables, we can simply avoid the set call. We can also avoid the set call for all these strong paths, for all these strongly uh, connected nodes, uh, because in those cases, we can already deduce from the modal implication graph whether we need to select or not select a certain feature. And then only for the remaining ones, we need to call a set solver and we can see what this means in terms of uh, performance. When we go through the configuration, uh, here we have different colors and uh, green and blue are the colors for the modal implication graphs. There are two versions of this, but basically the, the picture says we cannot no longer uh, actually uh, recognize uh, any, uh, yeah, any uh, performance because in most of the cases, most of the clicks, it's just zero seconds, right? You just look into the graph, sometimes you go one edge and that's, uh, that's uh, brings us to zero seconds. But of course, where does the effort go? Uh, we have some offline computation going on and the offline computation means that whenever we change the dependencies among the features, we have to recreate the modal implication graph. And this takes some time. And here it comes also into play that there are different versions, a complete modal implication graph, finding as much as possible of these strong edges and a version that can be computed faster. And then in combination, we can uh, see that uh, already two, uh, two uh, configuration processes, uh, if we have two configuration, full configuration process where we select all the features, uh, then we are already faster uh, than the um, uh, methods that have been there before. So this was the, the first part of the talk and uh, the main part was like we have software configuration, we have product configuration and the main problem with configuration is we have configuration options and dependencies among them. So now in the second part of the talk I would like to talk about quality assurance for those systems. So First of all, when we do want to do quality assurance, the first thing we need to understand, is it feasible to just check every valid configuration? And it's not. Basically, this graph is uh, telling you these are different systems of a different size that you can see on the x-axis. Uh, and these systems are really huge. It's, it's infeasible to even like imagine how large they are. And there are even data points uh, somewhere up here that say uh, that are as large as uh, something like this. Uh, size. So we found an automotive system with this amount of uh, valid configurations. So it's, it's simply too large to look at all of them. So now the question is what to do? And we looked at the systems and we looked at their interactions, which means which features are actually influencing the, uh, each other during the execution of a system. 
And we found out that in, in most of the cases, it's just a few features that are actually interact. And imagine that during the execu execution of a system at a particular position, uh, you uh, make a mistake in the program, right? So you have a, uh, a problem, a bug or something like this, uh, then, uh, or a security problem, then this can uh, only affect a combination of a very low amount of features and uh, only those can interact. And the way we can use this information, and it has been used before in the literature, although the, those studies were not there, uh, is that we can rely on the fact that faults are typically forced caused by an interaction of few features. And let's look at a very brief and small example. Here we have a database, and the database has 26 configurations. So we can have the database on Windows on the left-hand side and on Unix on the right-hand side. And then we have different configuration, and the configuration is basically a set of single letters, a single letter for every feature. Of course, for large systems, it's not feasible to think of testing them all, but it even involves redundant efforts. So what can we do about this? And the idea of pairwise interaction testing, which was introduced by others already before, is every single configuration that you can take will cover already a couple of the feature interactions. And then we can select the next configuration and it will cover something. And in this example, already six configurations uh, are feasible, uh, with six configurations, it's feasible to cover all the uh, two wise interactions of features. This is uh, known as a set cover problem, or it's at least related to that, which is known to be NP complete. And there have been first greedy algorithms, uh, which are still our baseline for today uh, from, the, from the, uh, late 70s, from the last century. So we created new algorithms for this purpose uh, to compute these uh, small, uh, small as possible sets of configurations. And we've uh, named these Inkling and Yaza, and we're asking ourselves, are they faster than the, uh, than the related uh, work, uh, than the other algorithms? And we found out that we have quite fast algorithms, and Inkling and Yaza are both faster than the state of the art. But then it comes also to quality. I mean, do we just uh, trade uh, speed for quality? And we found out that the, the quality is still good and we even re receive better results if we look, if we kind of do some more iterations of the same algorithm. So YASA 5 is kind of bringing the smallest samples that you can create uh, with any algorithm in the literature. So in the last part of the talk, I will just give a very brief overview on the empirical methods that we have done in the past. So for instance, we've done uh, expert literature surveys. So giving an overview in the literature for people not involved in the topic, but also for the researchers to understand what are the commonalities, what are the differences of different uh, algorithms, of different approaches. Uh, then we've looked at, uh, uh, yeah, questionnaires, questionnaires to uh, decide uh, which language features to bring into a new language, which, which is supposed to be un the universal variability language, so a language used by most of the community, similar to like the efforts that UML have been done. But we also looked into user studies, and this is something uh, that I haven't talked uh, about in this talk, but that we also worked on. It's like formal verification of programs, where we give a specification and we verify the program formally, where we can give a proof that uh, the program is correct. And we found out that uh, when you develop uh, verified programs, uh, people are actually writing the correct program, that it, but they need to change it again and again and uh, get the specification right in order to uh, let, the, let the verifier verify the system. And we were interested also to understand, I mean, is this formal verification, deductive verification actually feasible for real world programs? And we found out that uh, there are still uh, a number of uh, yeah, problems. For instance, in this case, we uh, started to verify OpenJDK, a number of classes and methods in there, and we found problems in their informal specification in the code. So there are actually real bugs, real problems uh, within the uh, uh, open source uh, implementation. In this talk, I wanted to give you an overview on uh, previous research that we have done uh, on like configuration, software and product configuration, which is kind of influencing many people 
from different communities, uh, but also um, it's a matter of quality assurance, a matter of how can we deal with this um, with these large configuration spaces. And something uh, we developed, uh, for instance, data structures like the modal implication graphs. We also developed new algorithms, uh, algorithms even using these data structures, uh, and shown that these are faster. But we also worked on a couple of uh, uh, or many different uh, empirical evaluation methods to understand the impact of our research on the state of the art. So I would like to thank you for uh, watching this talk. Uh, you uh, might have gotten an, at least an overview on the research. Of course, when talking about 15 years of research, it's not only uh, it's it's necessarily incomplete. So these were just some highlights on the research, and I will link some other videos uh, that you might want to use and watch later on. Enjoy your time. <laughs>